Hey there. Well, welcome. We are in the second uh, aspect of what we're accomplishing here in grasping God's Word. The first part uh, was entitled How to Read the Book. And those were the basic tools. And so congratulations, you made it through basic training, and uh, you've uh, graduated to uh, the context. And you're going to find that as we go through uh, these various steps, and as we go into the context, I think you'll find that it becomes more interesting as we go. And uh, what happens is uh, you'll, you'll find it kind of takes form and really uh, has a lot of meaning to it. So we began the first lesson with the interpretive journey. We talked about all the different steps. How many steps are there? Four. Yeah, four in the second edition, five in the third. We talked about five, uh, five steps. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to establish, first of all, uh, what does the scripture say, not what we would interpret it to be. What does it actually say? And so we had a couple of weeks there looking at sentences the first week, paragraphs, discourses last week, just to try to, to really regain our focus on the Word of God. And so we're measuring how careful we're coming to the Bible, how careful we're actually uh, studying things. And so it's valuable for us to, to sit there and not pass over what is tremendously obvious. And so we're stating the obvious. You need to be careful. You need to be able to, to really extract the words. And we look for all the different types of uh, literary um, uh, methods and, and uh, processes and try to bring those to the forefront of our, our, uh, uh, our thought process. Hopefully, as you've been reading God's Word on your own, you've been able to pick up on some of the things that uh, we've been talking about. And that's a, a great place then to start. So tonight, we're going to consider what do we bring to the text. It's part of the second uh, aspect of studying here uh, uh, regarding the context. And so uh, tonight, uh, we'll, we'll challenge you uh, a little bit here, I think, with regard to, you know, what am I bringing to this text? Maybe a question that you've never asked yourself before. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. We'll ask God to bless our time here tonight. Father, we come before you this evening, and we're thankful, Lord, for the text itself. Uh, you have uh, given to us the inerrant word, and Lord, we're very thankful that we're able to possess uh, reliable copies of your word. The original autographs being inspired, we are so blessed. Uh, in our day, we can go and buy a Bible. Some have red letter editions. Some are... Uh, different colors on the outside, uh, but Father, they're all, uh, uh, many of them, uh, really close uh, to the original, Father, and we're very thankful uh, for how you've preserved your word. <clears throat> Help us, Lord, tonight as we would understand uh, some of the barriers that we have to the ultimate interpretation and application. And Father, we think of uh, what we bring to the text. Help us, Lord, to have a, an open mind to our study tonight that we would understand um, uh, really some of our biases and some of the things that we're bringing uh, that we may not be aware of. So, Lord, I just pray that you bless our time together here tonight. Thank you for each one who's come tonight. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, here we are. We're going to start off by looking here at an illustration. I read this, uh, this illustration. I thought it was just a tremendous illustration uh, because it really makes the point uh, so very, very well for us. The story begins with Danny and his family. They spent several years working as missionaries in Ethiopia, and uh, they were privileged to watch a Christmas pageant presented by an Ethiopian evangelical church. Well, was that ever a different experience? Uh, there were no Christmas trees with lights. There was no snow. The weather was balmy. There were banana trees growing right outside the church. Over 400 people crowded into this church building that had seating for maybe 150. All right, so you get the idea. It's jam-packed. And they use the term seating loosely. The pews consisted of uncomfortable benches constructed out of rough, uneven hand hewn lumber. So you know what that felt like. Church's dirt floors, mud walls, rafters made of eucalyptus poles of various sizes, and a corrugated steel roof over the top. That's the church. So whenever the sun would go behind a cloud, the change in temperature on the corrugated steel roof would cause it to contract, creating a creaking, groaning sound for several seconds. Then the sun would emerge again, causing the roof to get hot, and the corrugated steel would repeat the ritual moans until the metal had expanded back to its original size. So thus, a certain background rhythm of roof groaning developed, 
the inciting the inside of the church was lit by uh, two 40 watt light bulbs. That's something. That's saying something, right? This is remember Ethiopia. So most of the needed light was usually provided by numerous windows, but this particular day, most of the light was blocked by the dozens of uh, eager spectators that are jammed around every window, even windows standing outside the church, standing on their tiptoes and craning their necks trying to see. Um, They had arrived too late to get a seat inside. Christmas pageants in the United States are fairly stereotypical. Danny assumed this one would be similar. How else can you tell the story? Why is he in for a big shock? Pageant starts out normal enough at the beginning. There's a town crier of sorts walking back and forth, shouting through a megaphone, proclaiming the new Roman census requirements, similar to Linus Proclamation, Luke chapter 2-1. Um, you know, that starts all peanuts pageants the same way. After uh, preparation by Joseph's family, he and Mary finally departed for Bethlehem. So here's when the pageant begins to differ. Joseph and Mary did not travel alone. Mary, quite big in her last month of pregnancy, was accompanied by over a dozen aunts and female cousins. Joseph walked alone in front, followed by all these women who were chatting and giggling merrily about babies and motherly things. Whoa, Danny thought, whatever happened to the typical travel scene with Mary, Joseph, and the donkey? Where did all these people come from? They're not the story. A few minutes later, the noisy entourage arrive in Bethlehem, and they're directed to the sheep pen, crowding the sheep. Soon Mary starts into labor. Joseph paces nervously back and forth in front of the stable while the women, several of them midwives, crowd around Mary and help deliver the baby. Short labor ensued. Soon the women all gave a high, shrill, vibrating cry. The typical Ethiopian joy cry (laughs) that announces the birth of every child in Ethiopia. The spectators cheered and the women in the crowd joined in the cry, the joy cry, with the actors. So everybody's making the sound. They're all, you know, it's kind of like, you know, we'd be like clapping and and maybe cheering. So they're all cheering and hearing the cry inside the manger then. uh, Joseph runs uh, inside because he hears it all and he sees the newborn baby. Later, of course, the familiar shepherds came, followed by the wise men. And the pageant took two hours to reenact. All right, two hours. Ours usually lasts about 20 minutes. So big difference here. What struck Danny was the way in which the Ethiopians had interpreted the story through their culture. They were not consciously contextualizing the story to make it Ethiopian. They were trying to portray it in the way they thought it actually happened. Yet notice what they did. As we do in our pageants, they filled in all the gaps in the story with explanations that made sense in their culture. For the Ethiopians, it's unthinkable that Mary's family would have allowed her to make this trip by herself. She was a young woman expecting her first baby, and the Ethiopians could not imagine her making the trip with only Joseph to help her. Who, after all, would deliver the baby? You know Joseph wasn't going to do that, right? I mean, seriously. Uh, it, it was, it was, it, when he looked at this, and it would have been the same for all of us, I think we would have had an amazing reaction to the context of the Ethiopian pageant. But certain elements, would we agree? They make sense, don't they? I mean, I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, yeah, I think we need to add a few midwives to the next uh, Christmas pageant because I think they have that correct, all right? I think the way we look at it taints the overall picture because what we tend to do, and don't miss this, is important, we fill in the gaps. So if there's gaps, we fill them in, and we don't fill them in like Step one, determining the text in their town. We don't try to do it that way. We usually take some aspect of our culture and we embed that into the understanding. So we fill the gaps in with 2018. And uh, that causes us to end up with a a different uh, pageant than they would have in their context. So it's not a big deal to us in North America because we live in a world of doctors and hospitals. That's why it makes sense for Joseph and Mary to be traveling along. I mean, worst case, the, you know, she has uh, labor pains and you look for one of those blue signs on the side of the highway. And, you know, you pull off and you get in there to the ER and find out where the maternity is and away you go. And uh, if you're Joseph, you can hang out by the vending machines and watch ESPN. I mean, it, it, it's totally sensible to us, uh, but not in, in their point of view. So we know Joseph didn't deliver the baby. And the Ethiopians would laugh at us for thinking that he was going to do that. 
But that's their perspective. They're not thinking doctors. They're not thinking hospitals. So notice what's happened. As we in America portray the story, we fill in the silent gaps with an Americanized viewpoint. In our world, we deal primarily with the nuclear family units, mom, dad, and children. We have no problem with Joseph and Mary traveling by themselves. It never occurs to us to consider midwives because we really use them. We are familiar in our culture with the scene of a young man and his pregnant wife rushing off alone to the hospital by themselves as she starts into labor. So the man checks the wife in at the hospital and uh, boom, baby's there. So the Ethiopians, totally different culture experience and it only makes sense that she would be surrounded by family and midwives and so forth. So both sides, the American version and the Ethiopian version, both take some liberty, don't they? They both take some liberty. These are not gaps that, that are filled in by scripture. That's why they're gaps. There's certain things the Bible doesn't tell us. It tells us that you know, there was a census that Mary and Joseph went down there to Bethlehem. We get all that and, and we understand it, but then there's these gaps. And so we're trying to figure out, well, how do we, how do we fill in what's not there? And we do that by grabbing a hold of our, our surroundings. Does that make sense? So we agree that, that our Americanized view is definitely going to taint certain things. So there's two sections that we're going to be looking at here tonight. The first is pre-understanding, pre-understanding. And the second is going to be presuppositions. They both start PRE, but they're both very different. So we want to start off with pre-understandings. Remember when Dr. Farnham was here, we talked about um, sharing Christ with uh, another person, and we talked about the reality of our, uh, the reality in our society and our culture where people have certain pre-understandings. And if someone says, well, I'm an atheist, they have certain pre-understandings. And his point was, start asking questions because oftentimes they're not sure exactly what they believe. And you need to peel back those layers to see uh, exactly how embedded that statement is. And oftentimes the statement changes that over time. You and I um, are always going to, to have pre-understandings. Even as we read the scriptures, we're going to bring pre-understanding uh, to the verses that we read. And what we're going to find here, it's kind of fascinating in, in a lot of ways. Our pre-understanding is going to refer to all of our preconceived notions and understandings that we bring that have been formulated consciously and un unconsciously, subconsciously. Um, and we usually bring these things before we actually study the text in detail. The problem is the broader issue that links with the cultural problems introduced in the pageant story and discussed um, below in our notes here, um, we're going to see that pre-understanding is going to include specific experiences and encounters that we've had in our lives. Uh, this is going to truly impact um, what we believe. And let me just go back and just give you an illustration. If you grew up in the church, how many grew up in the church and heard evangelists that used to come for sometimes, back in the day, I can tell how old you are by whether or not you can. Um, but but uh, the evangelists would come for a week. Does anybody remember week-long meetings? Okay, yeah. Um, you, oh, revival. Yeah, revival meetings. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, that was fairly common, you know, 30, 40 years ago, uh, where a week-long evangelistic meeting, our missions conferences were a week. Um, in duration as well, um, those types of things. There are things that you no doubt heard evangelists say that have probably stuck with you if you were a week long in meetings. Evangelists were always cool because they had these little cliches and uh, they would repeat those cliches every church they went to. And some of those cliches would stick in your, your mind. Do you know what I mean? I mean, they really did. And all of those things that are back there in our minds are going to bring about uh, some level of pre-understanding. Okay, they're going to be an influence in our life. Now, I'm not saying that they're an influence for bad. I am not saying that they're always an influence for good. It all depends. But the point is, when we go to the text, sometimes we're going to be tempted to jump to the interpretation 
without doing the work because we're basing it on our pre-understandings. <coughs> My pre-understanding is this, so I can tell you already what this text means. Okay? And if you don't have time to study, that's great, isn't it? <laughs> you just got to launch into it and say, well, here it is. It must mean this because I remember so-and-so saying this or somebody saying that. <coughs> so the first thing we have to stop and think about is pre-understanding includes specific experiences. And pre-understanding is going to be formed by those good and bad. They're also um, <coughs> going to be, uh, there's so many of these different pre-understandings that can be um, impactful. Uh, I just gave the illustration of, sorry, of evangelists. Uh, what, are, what are some other things that are contributing to pre-understanding in your mind? Theology. Your theology. And Bob, when we get to the section in presuppositions, we're actually going to see that there's, uh, I'm going to part that down the middle and kind of say, okay, our theology, but you're right. You're right. Theology is going to play a big part in this. Absolutely. Books, Christian movies. Yeah. Yeah. There's movies I think can explain you more. Oh, yeah. You tend to think it should be right. That's right. That's right. I've, I've had someone come up to me and say, well, did you see this movie? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, well, you know, in the movie, this is what happens, and become argumentative. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> um, now, the, the movie shaped their pre understanding. Yeah. Totally. What else shapes our pre understanding today? How you're raised. How you're raised. We're going to talk about that in detail in a moment. Sunday school. Sunday school. You're, everything that has gone through your brain in the teachings over the years is impacting you and, and giving you some pre-understanding. What else? Christian music. Christian music has a strong impact uh, on us, without a doubt. Uh, it is going to create pre-understandings. Uh, is it fair to say it's going to create really good positive pre-understandings or some negative pre-understandings? Can vary, can it? Who writes most of the Christian music today? Charismatics. You think the charismatic theology impacts the music? Tremendously, tremendously. There are so many songs that are really not what I would say I believe, or I believe the Bible teaches, um, that are floating around out there. And every once in a while, someone would come up and say, well, I think that song, and yeah, they're probably right. <laughs> yeah, they're probably right. Um, but views, um, uh, different views, different understandings. Um, Try to think of the girl who sang. Uh, who's that girl you didn't like the concert? <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> Rebecca St. James, yeah. She, she sings about, you know, going to hell and you know, different things and being down there. And so I, I, yeah, anyway, I won't get it all into it. But it, it's just, it was, that's wrong theology. It's, it's, I'm not really sure exactly how you came up with that. But you'll, you'll see those types of things, and so you have to be careful. All these things are influencing so Christian music. What else? Anything else? Basically, we're saying anything. Biblical literature, non-biblical literature, art, uh, jokes, pop songs, everything is, is truly impacting us in one way or another, building up this uh, pre-understanding. So one of the problems that we have, and you'll see that in your notes, it says, note that your pre-understanding of any given passage may indeed be correct. The problem, however, is that often it's not. And until you study the text seriously, you simply don't know whether it's accurate. So the danger is for us to assume that our pre-understanding is always correct. <clears throat> and then uh, he, he references Van Hooser, he says, people who think that they're Pre-understanding is always correct. Have a problem with pride. <laughs> they have a problem with pride. <clears throat> we have to be very humble. Can I just point that out as we study God's Word? We have to be very humble. Uh, when we go to study God's Word, uh, we, we should be, um, on the one hand, on our knees asking God to give us wisdom because we desperately need that. We need the Holy Spirit's uh, work in our life, illuminating the Scripture, causing us to understand it. Because on our own, these pre-understandings that we have can really confuse um, the interpretation of a passage. 
And it's something that, unfortunately, we don't give enough attention to. And so there should be a, a measure of humility as we approach the scriptures. You know, I have people all the time, you know, come up to me and say, well, you know, Pastor Kevin, you know, you missed the point. Here's the point in the message. You missed this point. And um, it's like, okay, you know, um, and I'm not saying I did or I didn't. I mean, I've missed lots of points. I've missed way more points than there are people. <laughs> okay. Um, that's the truth of the matter. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, but the truth is we humbly come to God's word. You know, I've never actually point that out to someone myself because I just wouldn't. I mean, it's just who knows? I mean, um, I'm trusting the Spirit of God to lead a, a teacher and I'm understanding right off the bat that I don't have all the answers. And uh, I, I want to have all the answers and I'm pretty certain that 1 Corinthians 13 passage, you know, when uh, <laughs> we're, we're not uh, looking through a glass darkly, but face to face, we'll have a lot more answers than we have now. And I'm okay with waiting. In the meantime, I want to make sure that Kevin Cassidy is not messing up the interpretation. That's what you want to do. You want to look at yourself in the mirror and say, Lord, help me not to mess up this, in, this uh, interpretation. Because my pre-understanding is not always correct. A lot of times it is correct. But a lot of times it could be wrong. And so that's why there's really no shortcuts that you want to, to, to follow. You want to be very fair uh, with the scripture. Another dangerous aspect of pre-understanding surfaces when we come to the text with the theological agenda already formulated. What does he mean when he makes that statement? A theological agenda. And can you give me an example of a theological agenda? Um, I see it a lot on social media when people want to bolster their, I'm just going to say it, social justice position. Okay. Using the Bible, mm -hmm. and they take one verse and wrap their whole theological presupposition around that, and it's incorrect to start with. Yeah. And that's a problem. And I just, when I was reading that paragraph before, and then you were talking, and we read that, a lot of people do that. Yeah. And I try not to do that. And that's why when you said we have to, you know, ask God to help us look at this passage correctly. But it's so easy to do that, because if you're looking for something about hope, and you look in the Bible, oh, there's the word hope. I'm going to use it. And then you never look at the stuff before or after. Right. And then you look silly yeah. and ignorant. Right. Right. I mean, some people call character. Yeah. 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 I do. BibleGateway.com, type in yes. the word. Right. Boom, there they all are. <laughs> Us all fit together. And, you, you, and correct me if I'm wrong, you didn't type in a Greek word, you typed in an English word, so who, what, who knows which Greek word it is, right? <clears throat> okay, good, good point. Thanks, Paul. Uh, how, about, how about another example of a theological agenda? How about people trying to predict the, uh, the Lord is going to return? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would be, yeah. And, and that, that belief, usually there's a belief that it's coming quickly, right? So you're going to go to the scriptures, and you're going to try to, maybe through numerology, you're going to try to work things to, to point that out. But the presupposition that's faulty is that um, while we believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ, the Bible is very clear in saying that no man knows the, fa the, the, the time except the Father. So we have to be really careful about that and saying, okay, it's imminent, and so it must be going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, you have to be careful. And they don't even do lifetime, they do in decade or in a year, two years. So you have to be you have to be careful of that. Any other theological uh, agendas? Those who actually use the Bible to attack Christianity. I've heard one where they basically it's taking the statement, the woman the wife shall submit to her husband. And blowing that out of proportion to something that it's not even related to, kind of equating to basically slavery. Mm -hmm. Yep. Charles? I think uh, I would go towards theological doctrine um, of different uh, denominations would be a theological. Yeah. Uh, right. Right. You have to be really careful because this this is something that. You know, you, you want to be really objective when you come to the God's Word. That's what this lesson really is about here tonight. If I have a theological, uh, a theological pre-understanding, 
that, um, or an agenda, um, and there's a difference between the presuppositions that we're going to talk about in a moment and talking about an agenda. Your agenda is going to drive everything you're doing. That's, that's why that word agenda is really important. And you're looking for anything you can grab a hold of to fit within that agenda. And that becomes dangerous. You, you can easily get sideways on that. All right, so moving on, the second thing we need to realize here is a related danger, um, and that's of familiarity. Uh, if we're thoroughly familiar with a passage, we tend to think we know all there is to know about it. And we, we're prone to skip over it without studying it carefully. Are you a Sunday school teacher? Are you a children's church teacher? You've seen that material probably over and over and over again, haven't you? You, you probably have. You're probably thinking to yourself, okay, so this week I'm teaching on Jonah. I've taught on Jonah 47 times since I was saved. And you're thinking to yourself, um, I'm not even going to bother reading the text, all right? Because I know this story so well that I'm just going to pair it right off to the kids, all right? And that is a, a danger because we're bringing a pre-understanding, aren't we? Are we really open to, to doing some serious study in God's Word? Are we really open to trying to, to understand what that passage says? Or are we just trying to, to get our lesson done and get out the door? That's the problem. And the same thing is true for anyone, those in the pulpit. It's um, a tendency that we have to be very, very careful of. And again, this kind of goes back to those first couple of lessons that we just got through going through, reading the scripture carefully, looking at all the different literary devices, and trying to figure out how this goes. You know, and we gave that illustration. Go back and look at that illustration in Mark. I think it's fabulous, uh, where you have, uh, you know, a situation where you, you, you've got um, situations where, you know, someone's made whole. I think it's Matthew that he's made whole, and it's... It, it takes two steps for Jesus to heal him, and then he's talking to the disciples. And again, how do you put all that together? So if we skip over the serious, fresh study because we think we know it, um, all we're going to see is the same thing we saw last time, right? And what kind of result is going to be uh, had if you're a teacher? Is it going to be a dynamic, exciting lesson? <laughs> Or is it just, let's kill this 30 minutes here and let's move on, right? And so we have to be very careful about that. And then just a, just a word here that uh, I'll just kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent. But um, I, you would probably expect, you know, for the big teaching pastor who's going to stand up on Sunday morning that he's doing some fresh study in God's Word. You're going to think, well, okay, you know, we're paying him to do that, right? I mean, he's kind of like, hey, come on now. Uh, you need to be studying. And that's true. But it doesn't matter if it's the person up front or the person with the fours and fives. Everybody has the same responsibility, and that is to be energized and exciting and well-prepared because hearts are hearts. And I don't care how young they are or how old they are. Hearts are hearts. And this is all about a fresh study of God's Word. And you can say, well, I don't teach anybody. Th that's fine, too. This is, this is great for you to take with you so that you enhance your own uh, opportunities to study God's Word. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fantastic. But the reality is, without a doubt, you and I should also be looking at whatever level we're working with uh, people-wise. We're, we're trying to find here some fresh uh, understanding of this passage and we want to relate it as such. And so uh, God bless every one of you that, that teach young kids and minister with kids. Um, it, it's, a, it's a privilege that you have, it really is, and it's a, a real blessing, and uh, it bears much fruit. A lot of times the fruit you don't see right away, um, but that shouldn't uh, dissuade you. Keep going. <laughs> All right, number three, another danger here. One of the most powerful yet subtle aspects of pre-understanding is that of our culture. Our theology tells us to ask, what would Jesus do? And our culture may subconsciously be telling us to ask, what would Stallone do? 
<laughs> right? It's ours is updated to Jason Bourne. Is it Jason Bourne? Yeah. Third edition is Jason Bourne. I mean, yeah. uh, Chuck Norris. You got Chuck Norris? Yeah. Wow. Wow. But didn't Jason Bourne like need the blue pill? No. That was a big ass. No, 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 no. Jason Bourne. Yeah. Jason Bourne, Bourne Identity, Bourne all those. Remember, he's like this magic man. He had two pills. One was for his brain, one was for his body. And then he got off of it. They flew to Korea, and that's the fourth one. You're not there yet. All right, so go ask, go ask the question. Here you go, you ready? What would Daniel Boone do? That's what I want to know. Shoot the bear. That's right, shoot the bear. We can eat the bear, we can get a bear rug, you know, whatever. Okay, bear grease, many purposes. Undoubtedly, our culture has tremendous influence. And um, he gives the illustration here of, you know, we read a command from Jesus, we try immediately to interpret it in a way so it doesn't conflict with our cultural norms, especially those set by the culture's heroes. Um, it's, it's kind of like, well, okay, when Jesus said, you know, if anyone strikes you, you're supposed to turn the other cheek. And we're thinking to ourselves, yeah, but we don't do that here in America. We don't turn the other cheek. Um, we try to hit you twice as hard as you hit us, so you don't hit us again, right? And, but what do, you do with a, what do you do with a passage like that? Uh, it's almost um, hollow. It is, isn't it? It's almost hollow in our culture because we don't, realistically apply it. Uh, we think to ourselves, well, yeah, that's, that, that was good back in Jesus' day. And uh, I guess if it was a Roman soldier who was standing there who smacked me, I wouldn't do anything. <laughs> I'd turn the other cheek. But if uh, this guy over here thinks he's going to get away with it, he's got another thing coming. So we're, we're going to um, bring about quite a bit of uh, cultural baggage because we're trying to fit these things into our thinking, and we want to have peace uh, with that. He gives the illustration in second edition. He says, you're about to embark on a long hike in the mountains on a hot day. You wear good hiking boots, you have a hat, sunglasses, canteen, maybe a walking stick. You have three or four suitcases, too, that you bring along, <laughs> because you never know what you might change into. How ridiculous, he says. Can you imagine hiking through the mountains with a suitcase under each arm? Well, if we're not careful, our culture will likewise weigh us down on the interpretive journey and hinder us from discovering and grasping God's word to us. Let's stop and think about it. Let's, let's, let's play this little mind game here tonight. The first step in the interpretive journey is what? We need to determine the text in their town. Right. What does it mean in their town? Are we doing that when the first thing we do is jump to a conclusion and say, oh, well, I can't apply that for me. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. I want you to think through this process so that it becomes eventually becomes natural to you, so that you, you know, the first thought is, I wonder what this means uh, in, in their town. Uh, what, what could possibly be, be meant there? And that's a, a very important first point, because if we jump immediately into the interpretation we're allowing this baggage really to guide us. And it's, it's taking us to places that are not linked up with the truth. And that's a huge, huge problem for us, right? So there's a lot of um, work in digging through and trying to make that determination of, you know, what does this mean uh, in their day? Uh, Sunday morning, I read that, that uh, passage from Luke chapter 7. Uh, you know, they, they, you're like, this generation, he says, is like children in the marketplace. Jesus is, is chewing out those guys, and uh, you know they, they play the flute, but they don't dance. Well, what's that mean? I mean, seriously, I mean, we usually skip over that passage, don't we? I mean, be honest, right? And uh, you know, uh, yet uh, wisdom is vindicated by all our children. It's like, <laughs> it's like, okay, what's the next thing? <laughs> what's what's the end of this chapter say? Let's let's get to that, and I'll find something in there that'll allow me to apply something to my life, right? That's kind of how we roll. I mean, be honest, that's how we roll. So we glide over scripture. Hey, what's that verse in 2 Timothy say about scripture? 
All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means the passage that I just did a flyover on, I'm disregarding it. Don't do that. Dig around. Say to yourself, you know what? I've never heard a pastor preach on it. Don't get discouraged by that. Preachers all the time skip over hard passages. <laughs> I try not to. But here's the, here's the rub. You know what the rub is? Be prepared for what it says. Be prepared for what it says, but also be prepared. And this is why this course is so important. This is why you want these tools. You, you don't want to quit the course. Be, stay the course. <laughs> Because there's, there's good stuff, and I'm going to put it all together for you. But here's the problem. You go, if you're the pastor, and you go to a passage of Scripture, and you say, oh, rent. I don't have any idea what this means. Okay? I mean, I, seriously, i got like five hours. i gotta, I got to prepare this message. You're starting at Saturday night, 9 o'clock, and uh, you need to give the message on Sunday morning, and uh, you're thinking to yourself, I don't know what this means, you know? So you go to your favorite set of commentaries, because they'll definitely know. And guess what you find when you go to the commentaries? They skipped it, too. <laughs> they skipped it, too. And, and it's not, that is not at all uncommon. It is far more common that you'll see that happen. And you'll go, oh, double rats. Uh, <laughs> Where's that message that I preached three years ago? Back in the file cabinet. We'll pull that one out and just kind of tell everybody the Spirit of God just changed my heart. <laughs> so, so seriously, what we want to do is we want to be able to have the tools, um, at least some of the tools ourselves. And I, again, it's, I know it's not exhaustive because we're not getting into, you know, Greek and Hebrew and that sort of thing. But you want to have these tools that you can go about seeking to find that. Now the information on the flute and they don't dance and the dirge and they won't wail, okay, that that was obtainable. You could find it, all right? It might not have been the easiest place to find, but I'm going to tell you where you can find that stuff, okay? So that you'll be able to dig through some of those things. Because I think that every Christian home ought to have a library. And uh, you ought to have a reference library. You ought to have a certain number of books that you can go to as a reference um, that will allow you to, uh, to be where you are. Or you can just buy Logos, Platinum Edition, put that on your computer, and you're good to go. All right? And that's probably a better deal than buying books, but you got to have a couple of grand or more. <laughs> Yahoo. All right. So as we look at this baggage, I want you to see here a good illustration. A good illustration of our culture's subconscious influence on our understanding occurs when we read the book of Jonah, we try to envision Jonah in the belly of the whale, don't we? I mean, that's, that's fairly typical. Um, I don't know if I can draw a whale. And here is Jonah. Probably six foot by eight foot stomach is what we normally see. And usually Jonah is there and he's sitting there and he's unhappy. Um, and he's, he's just kind of moaning and groaning. But he's, he's sitting there and, and there's some water in the bottom and it's maybe floating around. But there's there's always candlelight. You never notice that. Okay? And then we have um, little Jonah and he's usually thinking something. Why am I here? Okay, and and this is um, usually a vision of, of how we perceive uh, him. Um, would you agree with that? I mean, that's fairly typical. Do you know where that vision actually came from originally? Pinocchio. Where it was planted in our minds? Where did it come from? Pinocchio. Pinocchio, Disney, 19, what was it, 64? Um, it, it went back quite a ways. Uh, but that was where that image came from. If you were to stop and think about the condition of your stomach right now, other than being hungry right now, is your stomach open, like with space in it? If it is, you're eating gas eggs like crazy, right? Your stomach is like this, isn't it? 
Now, why would I think that that fish's stomach, and I know the fish's stomach is a little different. I mean, there's water in there, and it's pushing up, and there was air in there for him to breathe. We know that that's true. But this whole idea that he's in there, I actually had a picture. I was going to bring it tonight and throw it up there on the computer, but I had a picture of a guy, and he's in the belly of this fish, and he set up a little office, and he's got his books, and he's writing, and you know, he's got a filing cabinet. He's doing all right for himself, right? And it's just amazing the, the mental pictures that we tend to get. And even those things, as subtle as they are, oftentimes bring a pre-understanding. When you think of what Satan looks like, what is your pre-understanding? Is it that of Dante's Inferno? He's got a red suit on. He's got red horns. He's got a pitchfork. Um, you know, the image of, of even Satan comes across through our Americanized uh, culture. And, uh, different things cause that uh, to take place. So what do we mean by culture when we talk about culture? It's a combination of two things, family and national heritage. You started learning it very early. He says here, you learn it from your mom at breakfast, kids on the playground at school, television. That's culture. It's a mix of language, customs, stories, movies, jokes, literature, and national habits. For Americans, it's comprised of Big Macs, Barbie dolls, Tiger Woods. I mean, this is the second edition, so you probably have different things. <laughs> Lady, Gaga. Lady Gaga. There you go. Who is Lady Gaga? I mean, seriously, don't, don't bother me. Don't bother me. It can vary somewhat within an area. In other words, we have subcultures within the United States. That is true. But as a whole, it, you may have grown up in the inner city, you may be blue collar, you may be white collar, you may be Catholic home, you might have had a single parent home, might have had two parents, um, you might have been an orphan, um, but regardless of what those backgrounds are, you have a lot of common cultural features. This is across uh, uh, ethnic lines, if you move out of North America, it changes. Uh, but so much right here is really that combination of family and national heritage. Your family background is a central element in your culture world. You have inherited many, many values, ideas, and images from your family. You know, values, what about work, um, money. There's so many things that are going to impact you uh, in the way in which you think. And it's very, very different in different cultures outside of America. But for us, this is our context. So the American way, if you would, um, going to school, going to public school, if that's where you went. Some will go to private school, some will be homeschooled, but, but there's a lot of commonality. Um, it's, it's, you know, the movie theaters, it's the restaurants, it's all the stores. Um, America is very similar in a lot of ways. I always, I always laugh. It's like you can go just about anywhere in this country. You pull in, there's some kind of town center, and, and they've got the same blooming restaurants. They've got the same blooming stores. There's like no individuality. Even our cars look the same anymore, right? I mean, um, but it's the American way. Second thing is our family. Your family is going to provide you with your strongest frame of reference regarding relationships, right? I mean, without a doubt. And he goes on and he talks about if you had a loving father, it's very easy for you to shift over to understand a loving God. If you didn't have a loving father, uh, then it will be much more difficult for you uh, to understand a loving God. And so it's interesting how our family dynamic plays such an important part in the culture that we have immersed ourselves into. We recognize, he says, full well that Christians do not culturally misread the Bible intentionally. As noted above, all of us tend to be influenced by our culture subconsciously, whether we realize it or not. Interpretational reflex affects our interpretation in two ways. One, as mentioned in the Christmas pageant story, we tend to fill in all the gaps ourselves. And number two, more damaging to our interpretation is the fact that our cultural backgrounds preforms a parameter of limiting possibilities for a text. We limit possibilities for a text, again, 
because we have those parameters and they may be subconscious or they may be conscious parameters that we have. So that's important. He says, let's examine Jesus' command to turn the other cheek again. And he says, uh, our subconscious agenda seeks to legitimize our cultural worldview. That is the way things are done in our culture. Thus, before we even start to explore what Jesus meant, when he said this, we place parameters of possibility around the text and eliminate culturally conflicting possible meanings. It can't possibly mean that if someone bad hits you, you're to let them hit you again. However, by doing this, we're placing the culture above the Bible. That's the problem. That's the problem. You, you'll never get to the pure, true <coughs> interpretation of that passage if you're looking through the lens of culture and making that a determinative uh, factor in the interpretation and the application. Does that make sense? That's what we tend to do. And there are a lot of places we can see that happen. Um, looking here at Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Let me read a few verses here. <coughs> Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. Now that passage of scripture uh, starts out, and uh, you know it's it's got a lot of uh, it's got a lot of good points there in the very beginning, verse one. Every person is to be in subjection. There's no authority except from God. Those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. Now I want you to stop and I want you to think about that. When it comes to civil disobedience, should we as Christians be part of civil disobedience? Hmm. Yes. Yes. If it's against the Bible. All right. You might be able to make a case for a couple of different things. I want you to think back, though, to 1700s. When the colonists were in a situation where they were governed by Britain and they felt the need to resist the authority of England, right? And that happens, and we are very, very patriotic, are we not? I mean, we're coming up on 4th of July. We're already planning what we're going to do here in a couple weeks to celebrate this great nation. But let me ask yourself a question. Ask yourself this question. If you were alive in the 1770s, and, or before that even, uh, and you were sitting there and thinking to yourself, hmm, uh, I just got through reading in my devotions Romans chapter 13. Uh, Romans 13 was written back in the 1700s, by the way. <laughs> and people did the Bibles, right? Um, would you be challenged as to whether or not it would be appropriate for you to resist England? Or should you not resist England? Now, what I'm doing is I'm making some of you mad. I understand said that right in the text, so just you know, bear with me. Um, the point is this, that we usually will say, hey, what are you kidding me? We had a right to do that. Those guys were no counts and taxing the daylights on our tea. And, you know, I mean, really, I mean, it, it was bad. Stop and think about it. Are you looking through the glass of culture in order to read what the scripture says? Or can you come objectively to Romans chapter 13? And if you did come to this passage object in an objective way, would you draw the conclusion that it was justifiable to resist, or should we have not resisted? 
Hmm. What do you think about that? Yeah. I think there's a problem because we, we're trying to look at it through three different cultural contexts. You're, you're trying to use an, uh, our cult cultural context today to review something that happened in the 1700s while they were trying to use their 1700 context, trying to interpret something that was, in, that was written uh, when scripture was breathed. Mm -hmm. So I mean, even, even back then, as God's word was passed uh, through writings and through the spoken word, there was a problem with context and cultural context. Paul trying to talk about these theological concepts through the, through the fact that he, he actually grew up a Jew mm -hmm. and trying to uh, teach these theological concepts to uh, Gentiles. So you kind of stack culture, you, you stack culture on culture on culture. It's mm -hmm. awesome. But would we would we agree that as we go to the scripture? We're looking at what the Bible says, and we're, we're going to need to apply that to 1700s. Maybe we'll apply it someday. Uh, I know there's other cultures that are applying this same thing to their situation today. The Word of God is, we're going to say it's timeless, right? We're going to say that it's, it's, the theological principles are enduring, right? So we would agree that that's the case. Here's our interpretive journey. We're looking at Romans chapter 13. We're trying to figure out how do we apply Romans chapter 13. How are we going to apply it? What's the first step? First step is what, is this, what does this mean in their town? What's the text mean? What's the text mean in their town? Who is Paul writing Romans to? He's writing Romans to Christians who are living in what time period? Under Nero. Under Nero. And we all know a few things because we've read some history books about Nero, right? I mean, it's fairly deranged. Um, and what was the predicament of the church back then? Great persecution. Highly persecuted, correct? Highly persecuted. And so Paul writes this passage in light of all of those things. So when we're trying to do this whole interpretive journey, ultimately we want to get to the application. We are looking, first of all, what's this text mean in their town? And we all go, Phew, praise the Lord, we don't suffer persecution like that, right? We're thankful for that. Uh, what's the second point? How wide is the river? How wide is the river for us today? Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except from God, and that which exists is established by God. Now, we, we can relate to that part, right? We understand that human government is ordained by God, and that we are um, having an understanding that, that God has, has provided this. It's been established by God. Notice verse 3. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinances of God. That's what it says, right? I mean, so that's that's something that we have to deal with. I thought we'd have to figure out, though, I was, funny, I was just asking my dad, we were talking about this kind of reading then about what was it like the Church of England or, or England? Uh, don't we have to determine what was it the authority? What were they, what were they even resisting? What were they being oppressed with or what was the exact issue that they were right. not resisting, if that makes any sense. Right, right. Like even in the, going to the movie, of course, uh, if anybody saw the movie The Apostle Paul, uh, I was torn with the idea, you know, the Christians that were being burned at the stake by Nero, and then there was a group of young men who were trying to basically say, why are we letting them do this to us? Uh, you know, you sort of had, I was almost a little bit lost as to why they were being burned at the stake. Could they have been quietly going about their business or 
you know, were they being burned because they continued to talk about Christ? I mean, I, sometimes you don't really understand exactly right. what the issue was. Right. And that's kind of a, that, that's a good thought. It's a separate thought, I think, to some degree from this context here. The point is this. When you read verse 3, you have to be able, if you're going to apply it, you're going to have to try to go through this interpretive process. You're going to have to measure the river, and you're going to have to say, okay, well, the river back in Paul's day was, well, it's a lot wider than ours, um, or maybe it's not that wide. I don't necessarily myself look at it as a wide river because I think that it's pretty cut and dry. What he's telling us is that human government has been established by God and that I have a responsibility to obey those who are in a higher power, right? I mean, that's kind of, okay, I, I get that. The difficulty for us is going to come when we're looking at something specifically like the American Revolution. And we're going to try to um, look at it and say, well, um, I'm not sure I'm going along with verse 3 because it can't apply to my cultural context. All right, So I have certain pre-understandings. And one of the pre-understandings that I have is that it was justifiable for the American patriots to throw the tea in the ocean and do those types of things. Now, let me just, let me just say one thing here. The... Um, Notes will tell us very carefully, of course the revolution is more complicated than we have admitted here, okay? There are many different aspects to the American Revolution. But let me just point out that the church, during the time of the American Revolution, was absolutely uh, compelled to obey verse 3. They were not ignoring verse 3. It wasn't like they just said, oh, forget it. My, my cultural context, my pre-understandings, forget it. Get your guns. Let's shoot. Um, that, that was not how it was. They looked at verse 3, and they were very careful to understand, well, you know, the river's not all that wide. There's a theological principle here, and the theological principle is that I should be supportive of government because God's word says later on that they're supposed to be encouraging good behavior and not evil. Okay, so those basic premises were, were laid out there. And so what happened was, um, and I won't go into it too much, but the theologians of the day, back in the 1700s, went to great lengths to biblically come up with some way to explain a justification, okay, uh, for their behavior in the American Revolution and root that in some aspect of scripture, okay? So they're not doing what we tend to do, okay? That's my point. Now, whether they were right or wrong in, because it goes all the way back to, it, it goes back to the 1500s, and it goes back to things that were written by Calvin and um, understandings and, and where it says there, um, and the, uh, therefore anyone who resists authority and they're saying that there's different levels. They came up with different levels of authority. So you had magistrates, and we're obeying the magistrates, but we have a tyrannical ruler, and the magistrates want to throw the ruler out. And so because of that, we are under authority, but we're not under the ruler's the authority. We're under the magistrate's authority, okay? What I'm trying to point out here is that when you come to the American Revolution, you just automatically say, hey, it's absolutely justifiable. And you haven't done all the work that those uh, theologians did back in the 1700s, actually back in the 1500s. You have to be really careful in admitting that, well, wait a minute, I might be looking through a glass here and coming up with my own explanation. They would not have done that. They had developed all types of things. There were documents and so forth that they worked on. They shared them with the church, and people rallied around those documents and said, yes, um, we, we believe uh, that that position is correct. Uh, we, we believe it. Interposition, it's resistance to tyranny through lower magistrates. That was basically what Calvin had come up with. And it was utilized um, previously uh, in another nation. So they came up with 
those types of things. Now, whether or not you pull it all apart, you agree with it. Not everyone agreed with it back in the 1700s. But the point is this, they tried to come around and say, well, okay, we're going to find some justification for this. We weren't looking through the glass of our culture. We're trying to find it in scripture. And I'll, I'll let God be the judge as to whether or not that was right, wrong, or different. Obviously, God has, has blessed the United States uh, in amazing ways, and we've been utilized uh, by God um, to keep places like Israel safe and so forth. It's all part of you know, what, what God is doing. But the point is this. We have to be really careful when we come to these types of passages um, that we don't bring our understanding and let that free understanding cloud the interpretation. Hopefully that makes sense. We still have any questions, comments? A couple of you have the answer. <laughs> All right. Can you think of another biblical passage that would be just out of hand dismissed as no possible way? Yeah. Spare the rod and spoil the child. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you mean another verse that just like seems too difficult to well, another verse that we would take our culture and say, there's no way our culture would support that. Mm -hmm. And so we have a pre-understanding that may dismiss that out of hand. Mm -hmm. Love your enemies. Love your enemies, yeah. maybe. How about Titus with the women in the church? Women in the church, yeah, that's a huge, huge deal. That's a huge deal. And that continues to evolve. Um, it used to be you were either complementarian or egalitarian. We're complementarian here. Um, now there's four different versions of complementarian. Okay, so it's um, it's amazing. But what we're doing is we're taking culture and we're looking through the lens of culture and trying to interpret scripture, and we're coming up with all kinds of possibilities. So you can be a church that believes. Some of that, um, none of that, um, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. <laughs> You've got all of these different different things that are, are popping up. That's a that's a great example. So there's there are a bunch of these places, and you're going to come across them, and you're going to look at them and say, Wow, okay, culture is really determining meaning, and that's a, a pre understanding problem. All right, uh, that we would have. So let's. Um, Let's look over here to the section here, <clears throat> presuppositions. Let's talk about presuppositions for a minute. <clears throat> Pre-understanding, including culture, let me just say this, is not inherently bad, but it can skew our understanding of the Bible if we're not careful. We don't want to totally abandon pre-understanding, throwing all of our you know, all of the things that have flowed into our brains that have been positive. We don't want to throw everything else out because we'll throw the baby out with the bathwater. What we want to do is we want to submit our pre-understanding to the text, placing it under the text rather than over the text. Does that make sense? This is at the bottom of 144. The bottom of 144 in, in the third page. There isn't a label for presupposition. There's not. No. Okay. All right. Did you find it? Foundational belief. It starts off saying what are. No, we're, 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 a, we're a paragraph before foundational belief. Okay, so it should start off under presuppositions, um, the second editions, our approach to pre understanding. So you should have I think you see that there. <clears throat> Biggest thing is, as we as we look at the scripture, we want the scripture to be able to drive the text. That that's why it's important. Even as you think of your your certain theological um, beliefs, all right, there are certain theological convictions that we hold to. Uh, there are certain presuppositions that we're going to find that we have. And what I want to do is try to make a distinction between, for instance. Um, presuppositions and certain theological agendas. And I'll, I'll do that here in a second. But our approach doesn't suggest that we read and interpret the Bible in a completely neutral manner or in a vacuum. There are certain presuppositional viewpoints, such as faith. Total objectivity is not possible. 
and it's not the goal of what we're trying to, to uh, set forward. What we're trying to show very clearly is that pre-understanding and, pre and presuppositions are two very different things. The pre-understandings can change and are changing over time. Pre-understandings change. For those who are 30 years younger than me, you will have different pre-understandings than I have. You, you'll have. That's why they changed the names of the actors in the second and third editions, right? Because things are changing. And, and the way people think is very, 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 very different. Very different. Uh, I, I like old movies. I especially like old Western movies. So if you get a chance, um, see the movie Law of Lawless. Law of the Lawless. Okay, it's got Dale Robertson in it, you know, it's, I think it's 1964, and uh, it's terrific. And it's, a, it's about, basically it comes down to a, there's a murder, and uh, the father's trying to get the son off the hook, and there's this big courtroom scene. I mean, it's, it's not a lot of violence, so there's not a lot of shooting or anything. But it's, it's amazing how the different people bring their testimony into the courtroom. And uh, it's fascinating because because this woman comes in and she sits down and the guy's making eyes at her who's on trial and he's trying to get her to leave and she won't leave and the prosecutor sees this and realizes oh there's something going on well she just happens to be the deceased uh widow see and now he's putting two and two together that these two were having a uh, an affair, see, and that's scandalous back in 64, I mean, right? And so they, he calls a witness, and the witness is this other woman, and she's a saloon girl, and uh, she says, well, I used to be uh, engaged with the, the, the defendant, and uh, we had arguments because, and the girl, had, the widow had just testified that she'd never seen this man before today, and, and she says, oh, we had fights over because he was going to see her. And I caught him in an embrace and so forth and so on. And, and, and wow, you know, some pretty juicy stuff. And the, prosecutor, and the defense attorney gets up there and the first thing he says is, I have only one question for you. Where do you work? She says, I work at the saloon. You can go sit down. They threw out her testimony because she worked in a saloon. All right? So that's 1964. And you're viewing that, and you're saying, oh, okay, you know, so her testimony is no, no good, kind of like a tax collector, right? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, their, their testimony was no good. But you can see how, if you just even watch movies, and I don't watch most modern movies, because the whole thing has changed, right? The whole morality, everything is, is very different, and many presuppositions have changed, unfortunately. But we're going to try to look at the solid presuppositions and understand the things that don't change. So pre-understandings are going to change, change from generation to generation. Presuppositions are not going to change. They're going to stay the same. Okay? All right. Now, here's some things we need to stop and think about. There are some really good presuppositions that we hold on to, and they are very, very positive. All right? Think about some of the biblical presuppositions that you have. Every time you open up the Bible, you don't open it up and say, hmm, now what is this book? Right? There are certain presuppositions. Give me some presuppositions that you have. The Bible is true. The Bible's true. God loves me. God loves me. God is good. God is good. God is just. God is just. God is wise. God is wise. Speaks to us through his word. Speaks to us through his word. We're forgiven. Okay, we're forgiven. We would also say certain things about the Bible. What are some presuppositions about the Bible that we have, specifically about the Bible? It's word of God. It's word of God. It's word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration. Okay. It's inspired. No mistakes. There's no mistakes. It's inerrant. Right. In its original manuscript. And the original autographs were Which seems to have come recently is that added on statement that I've noticed. That it was always that it was inerrant, but lately it's always in its original manuscript. Right. I was reading a commentary as a side note about that from 
I don't remember the guy right now, but and he was talking about how all the new translations have come out, and he was sort of trying to say, well, it's not because of new translations that we said that, but the other side might say, well, now we can lose the meaning through translations, so we have to say original manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of weird how he was putting it together, but I, that, I mean, that could be one of the, right. the ideas too about right. inerrancy. Yeah, I mean, you always want to watch I me. Mean, the whole liberal attack on the Bible is kind of cyclical, just kind of goes around. Next thing you know, there's an attack and there's a different angle. And uh, we want to be careful. Um, again, I, as I pray in the opening prayer, we have the reliable copies here, and we're very, very thankful for these. That's not to say every modern translation is reliable, but there are some that are very, very good. So that's a, that's a huge blessing. So we have certain presuppositions, you'd agree, with regard to the Bible. And then there are certain things that maybe you've studied and you have been able to look, here's what the Bible says about this, and so that becomes a presupposition as well, right? Certain things that you don't have to go back over. It's my presupposition that God created the earth in six days. I have no problem with that, okay? My understanding of God is he's so powerful he can speak into existence the universe and it really doesn't cause him to sweat. So that's a presupposition that I have. Um, we mentioned egalitarian, complementarian. I'm complementarian, that's a presupposition that I hold to. Um, there are many other things. I'm dispensational, that's a presupposition that I have as versus uh, covenant in my theology, um, which would lead me maybe to be reformed in my theology. I'm, that, that's not a presupposition that I have. I think there are certain things, though, that we have to be careful of, and we have to say, well, okay, I'm not really sure about certain aspects. Um, we get into the whole election thing, right, with the Calvinists and, and uh, you know, all of that, and uh, there's a lot of things that we don't understand there. I think the problem for us oftentimes is, and this is why I would not like to be um, stereotyped or buttonholed into a box, because if I'm going to say, well, I'm this, then I have to be very careful because everything, I, every passage I go to has to fit, okay? It has to fit with my theological agenda. And so that's a huge, huge problem. So as I preach and seek to find, here's what the interpretation of a certain text is, you might walk away and say, oh, I think that text is leaning towards election. That can't be right. Uh, let me tell you, there's a lot of places and there's a lot of things that I can't explain. All I can tell you is that in Romans chapter 9, God says, I'm God and I can do whatever I want to do. Mm -hmm. You know? And you can go through the whole thing. Well, John the baptizer, okay, was, was John the baptizer elected by God? Well, do you believe in irresistible grace? Do you believe John the baptizer could have said no to God? I mean, look, God can do whatever he wants to do. And the Bible says that God had worked in his life while he was still in the womb of his mother. All right? So you figure that out. If it doesn't fit with your system, I have no mercy on you whatsoever. <laughs> because you ought, to, you ought to chuck that system, and you need to go through the interpretive journey with every single passage and see what the passage says, not whether or not it fits your agenda. Okay? Now, that's as bold as I want to get. <laughs> but you see the point. There are presuppositions. We hold to those presuppositions. Like, we believe in faith. Faith alone saves. We believe in the the inerrant word of God. We believe in, in certain things. And, and that, that, that's wonderful. We should hold on to those presuppositions. We don't have to come to the scripture with an open mind to say, well, I don't have any idea what this means um, every time we come to the scripture. We're going to come to the passage. We're going to say, okay, what does it mean in their, in their town? How, why is the river? Where are the theological principles that build the bridge? And then the fourth step is we're going to consult the biblical map, right? We're going to look at all the rest of the passages of the Bible as a whole and try to determine, are we still in mind? You know, we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, here's some theological principles. Do those theological principles fit the rest of God's word? Or are we off? Are we off? So that's where we have to be careful. And that's um, kind of where we, we come together with this. Okay, so the conclusion here. Hopefully, third edition has concluded. I feel bad for you guys. You had that big headline that said presuppositions, you know, so you can keep it all straight. That's fair. Total objecti objectivity is not our goal. As Christians who have 
intimate relationships with God through Christ. We're not striving for neutral, objective viewpoints. We seek to hear what God has to say to us. We want objectivity within the framework of evangelical presuppositions like those listed above. Um, but we understand that uh, if we're really going to grasp God's word, we have to put all of the processes in order. We need to give detail to the word of God. We need to look for a fresh understanding of what that passage says. And uh, in unit one, we talked about that. In unit two, we're talking about that historical, cultural context um, next time as we get into that. So we've talked about what do we bring to the text? Pre understandings, presuppositions. And then next week, we're talking about the historical, cultural context that'll help us fill in the gaps and background of the biblical passage with the correct cultural and historical information. So next week when we get together, uh, we're going to talk about how do you find some of that historical context. And uh, I'll give you some information as to uh, maybe some sources that you can uh, grab a hold of and get those sources working for you. Uh, some good things to put on your shelves so that you can walk over, pull it, and, and check it out. So there's a lot to the historical context. Remember that first piece is what's the text mean in their town? That's sometimes the hardest part, trying to figure that out. What does it exactly mean? Um, and so it, it really uh, causes us to do some digging, right? Any questions? <coughs> All right. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll, uh, we'll meet back here again. This is what our, this is our fourth week together? Fourth week together. So we've got two more weeks. So we had six weeks uninterrupted. And then we have two weeks off. So 4th of July, you don't have to come. Um, you can go see the fireworks. And then the week after that, we're going to have 80-plus uh, kids running around here. And uh, that'll be exciting. And they'll be using all the spaces. So uh, we won't have that, that night either. So that's our word prayer. Father, again, we just thank you for giving the word of God to us, Lord, and uh, we're just so privileged. Help us, Father, to um, be able to think through some of the pre-understandings that we have that are cultural, um, that impact uh, how we approach the scripture. And help us, Father, with that. Help us, Lord, too, I pray, to um, uh, understand what biblical presuppositions uh, are and, and uh, what we should hold on to, Lord, and help us, Father, as we work through those. Uh, to really uh, understand what the scripture says and, and uh, be able to, to hold to the many uh, presuppositions that uh, are so important for, for us, Lord, as we come to the word of God. So, Lord, I just pray, again, that as we continue to go through this, that we'll understand better and better how to go through this interpretive journey. So I thank you, Father, for our time tonight that you allowed us to have. Bless each one, I pray. And give us, just give everybody a great rest of the week, Lord, I pray in Christ's name. Thank you.